Following Christ is not for the faint of heart. Striving to be a kingdom man isn't about packing up and taking a vacation. It's about getting your mind right, your gear packed, and heading into war. It's more important now than ever before to stand up for what's right and just in the eyes of the Lord and seek His truth. This ain't a cruise ship, fellas. It's a battleship. So buckle up and get ready for the truth, the uncomfortable truth. Hello and welcome back to the show. No fancy intros today because we have a special guest. So we're going to pass it to the prayer and then to uh, Sean to introduce our guest. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to uh, get together. And uh, you say we're two or more are gathered. You're present, Lord. Lord, help us uh, honor that and um, bring out the things that will resonate with anyone listening uh, for your glory, Lord. Uh, thank you for our guests and their time today and uh, their willingness to sit down with, with our group and uh, talk and uh, bless this time and uh, help us be great stewards of your word and uh, your light every day. Your name. Amen. 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 Cool deal. Hey, um, good morning, everybody. We're super excited uh, about our guest today, um, Micah Hoffpower. He's a friend and business colleague of mine, and um, he, um, he played professional baseball. And um, Micah was kind enough to, to drive over here this morning and join us all the way from Jacksonville, Texas, which is about an hour from where we live in Hallsville, Texas. So um, anyway, um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to ask Micah to come on this morning um, and is I feel like that there's testimony in accomplishing something that very few people accomplish. And um, I, I heard a statistic one time that less than <clears> – <throat> Less than 1% of people who play baseball ever make it to the major leagues. And uh, so, um, you know, we're excited uh, just about uh, M- Micah's story. And, uh, Micah, if you don't mind, uh, will you tell us, just maybe kind of starting off with college, um, a little bit about your road to the majors? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you guys very much for having me today. Um, when Sean asked me to do this, it was – it was pretty cool. We were we were talking about the the podcast and um, and I, I'm not a podcast guy. I just I, I have to write things down and we're um, we're not either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're in good still company. Learning, yeah. Still learning. Still learning. So so I, I read and write uh, and that, and that helps me. But uh, whenever he said this, so I started listening to it and and absolutely enjoyed it so far. So uh, thank you guys for that. Um, I I love that. But as far as the my road my road to the big leagues from uh, from the college level, you know, I started. Um, when I left high school, I was probably 6'2", maybe 165, 170 pounds. And so I didn't have a, I didn't have a whole lot of interest from big schools and things of that nature. Um, and so I'd never really played for my dad. My dad had always coached my older brother or my younger brother. Um, I don't know if it was – I'm really hard-headed and he just didn't want to deal with it. Um, and I'm starting to see that in my son. Um, but um, And I feel like that's probably what it was. But I had the opportunity to go play for him uh, at Lawn Morris. And um, I thought, you know, why would you go and play in the same conference? Uh, Panola wanted me to come play for them um, and a couple other smaller schools there in that same conference. And, I, you know, why would you go play for another school when every time you go face this school – He's going to know every weakness about you and how to get you out. So I thought, I'm going to go play for my dad. That'll be fun. Um, my dad was very key and instrumental in um, pushing us as kids. Um, he was never forced us to do anything, but was definitely very um, – if you start something, you're going to finish it. You're going to put your effort into it. You're going to um, you're going to do what you have to do to be successful in that in that particular particular moment. Um, so played two years there at Lon Morris. Had a really uh, – had a pretty good – pretty good – Pretty good run there at Lawn Morris, and then um, left Lawn Morris. Uh, had a couple of different offers to go play. Um, had some small offers at uh, Texas A and M, uh, Florida, places like that. Um, but the the school that really and, and I don't know if it was just where it was, um, but it really resonated with me was Lamar, and um, there they were probably the first school that really showed interest in me at Lawn Morris, and so uh, ended up there with a couple couple of years there at Lawn, at, at Lamar. Um, and then from from Lamar got drafted by the Cubs was drafted by the Devil Rays out of Lon Morris um, and it just didn't it just didn't feel right it wasn't where I wanted to be 
Um, what what year were you in, in college at that um, time? So I graduated high school in 98. So it was 90, I guess 98, 99, 99, 2000 was at Law Morris. Junior? And then, yeah. And then my junior year, or my sophomore year, I was drafted by the Devil Rays. And then my junior year, I went to Lamar, um, which was 2000, 2001. And then 2000, two, or 2001, 2002 was my senior there at Lamar. Um, and then the Cubs drafted me there. Man, we bounced around in the minor leagues. Um, had pretty good success to begin with. Um, realized what it meant to play a full professional season. Um, and it's a lot different than playing, you know, on Tuesdays and Fridays. I mean, you're playing seven days a week um, in the minor leagues. You're playing seven days a week. You may get may get a day off um, every three weeks, two to three weeks. Um, so it's a, it's a constant grind, a mental grind, um, physical grind, trying to stay in shape and stuff. And so um, I guess 2004 was my – Second year in professional baseball, was in double-A at that point. Um, had a good year there, 2005. Um, man, that's 2005 is when it really hit me in the face, that how hard it really was. Um, I got to the triple-A level, and, man, I just – I don't know if it was uh, – I, I don't know what it was, um, but I guess mentally um, I wasn't – I didn't feel like I was as good as some of the guys there, and so and I was defeated. Um and then, but I didn't feel like that was the end of my, I didn't feel like that was the end for me. Um, and so then in 2006, I got called into the office and this is kind of where my career, like my, my mindset changed. Um, I got called into the office and, you know, the, the guy, his name was Dave Bialis. He was our minor league uh, field coordinator. And he says, you know, Michael, look at this board. So I glance up at the board and he's, you know, where do you see yourself? Of course, I'm looking around and I'm like, I don't see my name, Dave, what's going on? He's like, well, we're trying to figure out where to put you. Oh crap! Okay, <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, and are you releasing me? And he's like, No, 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 we're not. He said, But we're going to send you to Double A. Um, and he said, and you, and We've got this young kid there that we really want you to help. And boy, that was like a dagger um, because it was like, Oh crap! They want me to be a coach. I'm now the old guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, how old were you at that time? Um, so that was 2006. I was 26. I mean, I wasn't old by any means, but uh, minor league baseball. Yes. In at the AA level, you're starting to get a little bit older. <clears throat> um, and in the way I looked at it was, I just spent a full, almost entire season in AAA, and now I'm going backwards. And so that really was, it. it boy, it was a gut check. Um, and so um, that's kind of when my, my faith kind of started. It was no longer in my hands. I didn't have, I didn't have control at that point. And so it was like, man, what do you do here? And so I asked them to release me. They said no. Um, I asked them to trade me. They said no. And so then it was just like, okay, God, you've got this. It's I'm done. I'm I'm out of it. You're in control here. Whatever happens, happens. Um, opening opening night, we were in Birmingham, Alabama. The guy hit a first baseman. He hit a double. Comes into second base and he kind of starts limping. And well, we didn't think any of it. You know, is what it is. Uh, next guy gets a base hit up the middle. He rounds third base and he falls down. And I'm like, what's going on? You know? And so, you know, they're like, you know, they, everybody called me Hoffy. Hoffy, get your stuff. You're going, you're running. Of course, I couldn't run a site in a week. So that was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> but so I go to third base. The guy comes off the field. N- no big deal. You know, I go on, uh, start playing or whatever. Well, that night goes, he broke his foot. And it just, it was nothing, you know, whatever. Um, and so from that point on, my mind was, it was a different mindset. Um, and so then finished that season uh, hit, through May. I hit more home runs than I'd ever hit. And then uh, got back to AAA, continued to hit more home runs, um, and then ended up 2007 having a great, great start to the year. First, first, first invite to big league spring training. Um, and then I don't, know, I don't remember what that actual day it was. I remember we were in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I was having the, was having the year of my life. Um, and, was already invited to the All Star Game for AAA. Things were going great, man. It was just a matter of time before I got called up, you know. And um, but then I started making it about me, right? And, and I'd lost that focus. And come around third base in Albuquerque, and I feel a pop in my left knee, and mm. I was like, "Oh, that's weird." And um, so I got to the dugout, kind of stumbled in the dugout, and at no way, shape, form, fashion was I coming out of that game. Um, and our trainer, you know, was like, "Come on, let's go." And I'm like, "Dude, I'm not coming out of this game. I'm not. I'm not. There's no way." You're putting me on the on the disabled list, and so he said, "All right, Hoffpower, if you can get your glove and you can walk from this dugout to first base and not fall down or not hurt, you can play." So I said, "No problem." So I get up and I take a couple steps and I fall down, mm-hmm. and I'm like, "Oh crap," you know. And he's like, "Let's go." So we go upstairs. Comes in, the doctor looks at me there. He says, "Vincent, it's a meniscus. You know, you're going to be out four to six weeks." And so I'm like, "That's not that bad. Four to six weeks will be okay." Um, 
get back to Des Moines. Uh, we were in Iowa at the time. Um, go in. They do an MRI there, and they come in, and then the, then the doc there, the orthopedic there, comes into the stadium, and he says, all right, Hoffie, sit down. And, I, and you guys know as well as I do. When somebody tells you to sit down, it's probably not good. Right. Um, and he says, he says, sit down. I said, no, doc, I can't. Just just tell me. And um, he says, you've you've torn some cartilage, and it's it's, it's going to require a pretty extensive surgery. And I'm like, okay, crap. Well, well what do I got to do? He said, we have two options. You can – do a what they call a cartilage graft, and you're going to be out one to two years. Well, I mean, I'm 27 at the time. Like one to two years, that's that's career ending. I'm like, what can you do to get me back on the field? And he says we can do this. It's called a microfracture surgery. I'm like, what's that? He said, I'm going to drill holes in your bone. They're going to let it bleed. You're not putting weight on it for six weeks, and at that point, then you're going to start rehab, and you're going to be slow. I'm like, well, that's no big deal. I'm already slow. Um, so I wasn't worried, too worried about that. So did that, got that done. Um, but in all this, the, the blessing in all this was I'd never been able to put on weight. Like I couldn't put on weight no matter what I did. Workout, you know, I was built just like you are. I remember. I just couldn't put on weight. <laughs> and so in that six weeks time where I couldn't – I had no weight bearing, I got fat. I mean, literally I got fat um, because I sat there and they just – was in a machine that bent my leg back and forth. And that's all I could do. I did that for eight hours a day. Wow. And so I sat there. So then 2007, into 2007, uh, going to spring training in 2008, got an invite to big league camp, um, got there, had a great spring training. 2008, man, went off. Like if I could bottle up what I did in 2008, um, I don't know if we'd ever met uh, because I'd still be playing baseball. Wow. Um, it was it was stupid. I played 20, 71 games in AAA that year. Had 25 homers, 100 RBIs, hit like 360. I mean, it was it was ridiculous. Wow. Um, I got called to the big leagues about halfway through that year. Um, and so then it was just – it was really – it got to the point where when I got to the big leagues, I just – I wasn't as good as some of the guys. You know, and it was a self-evaluation type thing, and it didn't matter what I did. Um, I wasn't going to be – I wasn't going to be the, the all-star, right? And so I, I, I struggled with that role. And so then um, – I was, I was there for the most part of the year, or the most part of the rest of that year in 2008. 2009, spent most of the season there. Um, 2010, I got that little gut kick again. Um, you know, you're not our guy. Um, you know, you've got options. We're going to send you down, and we're going to bring up, you know, this this veteran guy. In, in, in 08 and 09, was it way different uh, from, like, uh, AAA? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's it, you, you think about – from a standpoint of in in the big leagues, you are you're flying on charter planes. Um, you're staying in five star hotels. You are obviously making really good money, and you're catered to completely differently. Uh, minor league baseball, I mean, it's just it's a grind, um, and you're not making great money um, until you've got to the big league level. And then once you've got to the big league level, you make pretty good money, but still not great money. And you're only getting paid six months out of the year. So, uh, but yes. Complete difference as far as the way you're treated, with that way things are, um, and just the overall experience of of it. Hmm. What a ride! Yeah, yeah. Um, what a ride! Yeah. That is amazing. Um, so, when you know you talk about the differences, um, you know from just when you received all those all those different gut checks, you mm-hmm. know, and you know from from the time I'm sure you were five years old until you know, those moments of gut checks, you were the all-star your entire life. For sure. So I, I can only, can only imagine that, uh, that feeling, you know, of, of getting, getting there and, and realizing <clears throat> these guys are in a different league than me. You know, I, oh, yeah. I would think that would, that would just be a, a defeating feeling. Um, you know, I, I can only imagine. Well, I, I, I didn't look at it, you know, obviously I, mean, I didn't look at it as a, you know, defeated. Um, I looked at it more of, you know, I was in a place where I felt like I was in a place where God wanted me to be. Right. Um, and I felt like at that point, my ability was, I'm, I'm a big fan of self-motivating, I mean, mm-hmm. self-evaluating. And so I, fe- I could look at myself in the mirror and I could go, okay, Derek Lee plays first base. Derek Lee's 6'5", 260, and he's, he's, he's an amazing guy. I mean, he was. He was a really, I mean, there's, there was no better guy that I could have played behind. But the dude was, he was just different. You know, and you could see that. And right. so, you know, and, and at that point, it was just kind of, what can I do? What can I do to set my family ahead? And so then you know, we ended up in Japan, and so that was um, that was pretty neat as well. So you know, we spent three years over there, um, and but 
man, I, I don't, I don't look at it like that. I'm a, I constantly look for positive and everything. Awesome. Um, and so I, I, I looked at my opportunity there, my time there as what can I do with that time to better my life, my family's life and things like that. And what can that spurn me to? And so, um, that's kind of the, I don't, I don't like to say defeated. I hear yeah. you. I hear you. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, I, I just th- I think there's a lot of people that would get defeated in that Absolutely. moment, and the fact that you didn't go that route, uh, I, I feel like it, it's just a testimony, uh, you know, mm-hmm. for for the rest of your life, which is it, really cool. It's, yeah. it's really special, you know, um, in my in my eyes, it's really special because I don't know I don't know anybody uh, besides Scott, you know, uh, right, which, right. which I don't know that well um, at all. You know, I know you better than I know Scott. And, uh, you know, uh, Scott's Copeland, um, and he's been back and forth and, you know, and, and just grinding it out in the minors uh, right. for, for, for quite a while. And just to hear your story and to hear that coming from you and to and just, uh, you know, reiterate, less than 1% of the people accomplish what you accomplished. Okay, so that's amazing. That's truly amazing. And, uh, you know, and I, I think that's a great – I think that's an awesome platform. Uh, and then – the fact that to sit here and hear you talk about, you know, I, I'm an optimist, you know, and I believe without being that optimist, I, I don't know if you ever would have made it to that level. Sure. And uh, I think that's huge, our mentality, uh, whenever it comes to, um, you know, going to level two or three or four, our, our mentality is huge. No doubt. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Mike, I got to tell you, Shane, when the guys told me you were coming on, I was excited because I was like, I, I'm fairly certain that's the same Micah that uh, I played against in uh, junior college. So I'm going to I'm gonna do a little bit of a deep dive on the baseball side. Okay. All right, we're going to have some fun. So I'm going to tell you these things first that I know about Micah before we have ever met today. One of the sweetest left-handed swings I have ever seen. Okay, now in junior college, a lot of people don't realize this, but in junior college in Texas, there are some studs for various and sundry reasons <laughs> that can be entertaining on occasion. Um, and Michael was right. You know, he was a slender guy, and you would go, there's no way that this guy can mash. And he would take a swing, and you'd be like, that is so effortless. I mean, I vividly remember it. Like, if anybody has watched – now. I'm not saying this to say I know that you got to be careful in baseball. There's a lot of sacrilegious comments that can be made. Are you going Palmero? I'm going going somewhere between Palmero and Griffey. Like the the stroke, it was that smooth. I can appreciate that. So I was really excited, and Shane kind of tasked me with, hey, do some, some baseball stuff because, as we know, that's my passion for sure. And I believe that baseball is one of the greatest teachers of what God has in your heart than about any other sport because even if you are a stud, you're going to fail more than you succeed That's right. all the time. That's right. And so it really brings you to how do I really handle failure? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I did a little bit of digging, and uh, I'm going to mention a few dates. Lord. Okay. And and <laughs> you, you, if you, I've got the information, so okay. if you're not – if you don't remember, I will tell the story from what I read. I if, bet, you, if you I, don't remember your own life, I, bet, I will tell you. I bet he remembers. Well, okay, <laughs> I'll be impressed. So I want to say this first. When when Sean talks about less than 1%, uh, Shane and I know somebody from Elysian Fields who was drafted, and I spent a week following him on the road. And, like, my mind could not comprehend how much of a grind it was till I saw it just for one week. You got guys sharing – uh, basements, mm-hmm. sleeping on mattresses on the floor, and they're loving life, sure. but they're making nothing. Uh, this was at single A and then oh, yeah. a high. Oh, yeah. Um, I think I brought home 850 bucks a month. Yes. For the first <clears throat> year, maybe two years of professional baseball. No wow. doubt. Yeah. And oh, so yeah. make more you know, money in the military. Wow. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so for it's sure. a grind. <laughs> so when Michael was drafted, he was the 393rd pick overall. Let that sink in. That's how many pretty, how many total go in the draft, think, Micah? Do you know that? I think my my the first time I was drafted, I think there was about fifteen hundred, and I was yeah. about four hundred fourteen hundred and ninety nine the first time. Okay, uh-huh. yeah, and that's so what, you said it didn't feel right. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> well, that was that's a whole other story. But I mean, we with the 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 leading up to that, like the the Rays had said that you know they were looking at me like middle second third round. Oh wow! And 
and ended up going into like the fifth or sixth round or something like that. Just and it, all it was was just people that they were expecting to already be off the board at the time were still on the board. So and it just pushed me back. And so yeah. it just I just didn't feel right. But that's yeah, yeah. that's awesome. But that, yes, that is right. Three ninety three. All right. That's correct. So September eighth, or excuse me, September ninth, two thousand eight. Five for five, Shea Stadium. Okay, what I have now. Tell me if this is wrong because this is. In the internet. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we know it tells the truth all the time. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. What I what I found there was four home runs at against Round Rock. Okay. So same. No different year. Two thousand eight happened in Round Rock. And okay. That would not have been in September. That would have probably been in May ish. Okay. Okay. Somewhere in May. So but September 9th in two thousand. You said nine? So I've got September 25th, 2008, you faced Pedro. I did. Five for five. Yes. Home run, double, single, home run, single. Yes. Wow. Five RBIs. Hey, was then, good night. I, Pedro I, was yeah, filthy, awesome. man. Yeah, Pedro was he filthy. Was, he was. And, and, and full disclosure here, Pedro was getting towards the end of his career. I don't tell people that. I don't often. care. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't matter. It was, it was, it was pretty cool. I, I ended up, I ended up three for three off Pedro. I had a homer, a double, and a single off of him. I hit a, Fastball, a curveball, and a changeup. Um, that was a fun game, man. It really was. Um, what, it was, it was what happened to the cycle? And I, <laughs> he he <laughs> said he couldn't run out of sight in a day. You yeah, got to find I, a big gap. The, the whole, the whole like, the triple's harder to hit than yeah, the home run. I'm telling you, man. And they, what do they say? This, this old saying is triples don't add up. You yeah. know, so we're, gonna, we're talking stats. We want our doubles yeah. to be higher. No yeah. doubt. Right. No doubt. You just got to get the zero out of the column. Okay. That's it. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. So, that's really awesome. Four home runs in one night. I, I didn't look up the details on that, but I would I imagine it's. Vividly. I bet you do. Yeah, yeah, That's got to be awesome. Yeah, it was. It was neat, man. Uh, we were in Round Rock, and I loved playing in Round Rock just for the sheer fact that that was probably one of the closest places that my family could come to. Yeah. And so most of them were usually there. When I say family, I don't just mean like my mom and dad or whatever. I mean I, like my wife's entire family. Um, her sister and her husband live in the Round Rock, Georgetown area now, and. I mean, there'd be 20, 25 people in the crowd that were strictly there because I was there. And so, um, and that was, that was in 2008. Like I said, if I could have bottled that up, um, every ball I hit was on the barrel that year. And I don't know what I did different as far as, you know, approach and whatnot. I was in the best shape of my life coming off that surgery. Um, and so I, I credit some of that to that. Um, but, man, I mean, the first at bat, I hit a ball, fastball middle of the way, um, hit center field, uh, you know, and then the next That's when bat, you know it's going to be a good day. Yeah. And uh, the next at bat was uh, the guy tried to beat me in. That was always my my spot was in. You could get me in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I pulled it to left, to right center field over the bullpen. And the next one, I hit back to center field. And then the last one was a backdoor breaking ball. And oh, wow. I hit it out to left center field. And I was like, you know, I'm like, I don't You're know. You're unconscious. Yeah, like, <laughs> You're like, I don't know what's yeah. happening here. So, you know, the next day, one of the guys from that team came up. They're like, dude, we were, we were, we were talking about drilling you. But we just want to see if you could do it again. And I was like, Dude, I don't even know, man. That's you know, and so it was. It was, it was good. Night. Unreal. That's awesome. Good night. So I've got one more little, a couple of fun tidbits, and then I'll get out of the way and let everybody else bounce ideas. But this will probably go down as my favorite podcast ever. So I appreciate your time. Uh, so I don't know if you guys know, but this guy's famous for other reasons. Oh man. Okay, so I'm going to ask him a question. He'll know what I'm talking about. The th- out of these three things. What would you say was the scariest or most uh, heart wrenching facing a 95 or above fastball, being on the 26th floor during an earthquake in Japan, or making a live appearance on TBS? <laughs> oh, no, well, um, so the scariest by far was was the earthquake. Okay, and that was like I've never in my life been in a point where I thought. I'm going to die. Uh-huh. And that day I thought I'm going to die. So uh, were you on the, was that the top floor? No, no. That, oh, the, the hotel, we were at this, this is the Tokyo dome hotel, man. It sat right in front of the Tokyo dome where the giants played. And, um, and there was probably 43, Jeez. 44 floors and you're sitting there and you hear this rumbling. Um, and it's like, it almost sounds like a subway car and you're like, man, what is that? And then you start to kind of feel a little bit of a vibration, um, and then you start to see like the lamp shade little 
pull drawstring mm. on the lamp, start to kind of shake. And then it starts to get a little bit violent. And me as the little country boy from East Texas, I was like, what is going on? This is crazy. You know, and I knew what, I knew it was an earthquake, but I had never, you know, we experienced a small one in Okinawa. Um, and so then all of a sudden, you know, like it started kind of getting kind of pretty violent. And, um, and so I jumped up and I'm like, I'm out of here. So I opened the door and I looked down the hallway and, and these, the, the housekeepers for the hotel, they're just going on about their business. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, if this little four foot, nothing, you know, 120 pound lady can deal with this, I, suck it up, big boy. You're okay. And so I went back into the hotel room and, and what seemed like an hour, um, but I know it wasn't, I know it wasn't truly that long. Um, but I go back and I sit down and I see the walls. I mean, you're talking, you're talking concrete walls that are actually moving, Jeez. and I'm going, okay, I don't care if they're leaving or not. I'm out of here. <laughs> and um, as I was walking out, the water in the toilet sw- sloshing out. I mean, it was it was pretty it was pretty intense. Wow. And so we finally get downstairs, and um, you know, I really did. I thought there's no way that a building can withstand something like that. But come to find out, that's exactly what they were designed for. Wow. Um, and so. It was really neat. Um, not, I shouldn't say neat. It was very. It was tragic. I mean, there were people that on our team that never heard from their family again. Um, some of the areas were just completely devastated, um, and so it was. It was really neat. But to see the way that country handled it, man, it was so different. Like if like the story with that. When I got downstairs, and I may cry. I'm here. Um, I'm an emotional person. But we get downstairs, and my wife is a worrier. All right. I mean. Big time, and, and I love her to death, but she worries. And so I knew that when she got up, it was about 14 hours, 12, 14 hour difference. I knew when she woke up that she would see this news and she would be distraught because she, there's no way she was going to be able to call me. Um, and so I go downstairs and I pick up one of my buddies, the, one of the guy's cell phones, and we're trying to call. It may, may have been my interpreter, Hide, and I'm trying to call my wife. And um, it just keeps just like, and I'm sure it was kind of like the 9-11 deal where nobody could call out signals, you know, completely blocked or whatever. And so I, mean, I just sat there and I said, Lord, I, you, you know Tiffany. She needs to hear my voice at this point. And so um, made the call. Call went through. Wow. And she's like, what's wrong? And I was like, listen, you're going to hear. And when you wake up, you're going to see devastation. I'm fine. We are completely safe. Everything's good. And I said, I love you. And then the phone cut out. And so it was, you know, from that day forward, you know, it's just like little things like that that, that always um, seem to creep in. And, and when you're doubting something, doubting a decision that you made or something like that. So that was a that was pretty, pretty wild experience. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow, so, man. That's cool. TBS thing, ah, that was that was fun. Um, it was pretty <laughs> neat. The My Boys deal, that yeah. was pretty cool. Uh, I still get – I get royalty checks from time to time. It's like <laughs> 37 cents. And That's it's like, awesome. Come on, man. It costs more for the stand. <laughs> 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 That was pretty fun. <laughs> That's awesome. So, Micah, I'm fascinated by your story. I'm always fascinated by um, stories of behind the scenes and and what people go through to, like, be truly, like, really, really good at something. Um, you know, a lot of that's God-given talent. And I sure. think you would you would attest to that. Um, you wouldn't have made it where you were without the Lord just blessing you with a gift. Sure. Right? And that gift carried you that far, and then that hard work and determination um, carried you the rest of the way. My question is, is you, you referenced um, the time you sat in the office and your name wasn't on the board, and you said, where do I fit in? Um, at that point, I had to give control up to the Lord and, and say, okay, this is basically your plan, not mine. How did your faith play a role in your career, um, either from that moment or, or where that, that seemed to be a defining moment for you, uh, but how did your faith play a role in your just your day-to-day walk and how hard is it to put that faith on a pedestal being a professional athlete? You took that, my question. That was deep. That, that was, that's, go, that's, boy. That, that was my question. That's deep. So, <laughs> Great question. I, I, I don't know. And first of all, I want to, I, I want you to understand, I, I struggle, um, even to this day, struggle daily with things like that. Um, 2005 was the first of, what I would consider many gut checks. Um, but letting go of control has always been something that's hard for me. And um, my faith gives me the ability to do that. Um, and so as far as the day-to-day trying to put the, my faith on a pedestal has always been a struggle for me. And I don't know why, um, but it, 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 it has. Um, and so... Like that particular moment, that set me in a, on a path 
to where I feel like I am now. Um, but as far as like the day to day stuff, man, my goal was to surround myself in that clubhouse with other like minded people. Um, because I'm more of a do as I do type person. Like I, my, I want my actions to show that this is where my faith lies. And so did you is, have, did you have a lot, I'm going to interject. Yeah. Did you have a lot of, um, a lot of the other guys in the locker room that, that did, um, that were Christians that, that, you know, or was I think, it, I think most guys, I think <clears throat> most guys, if you walked into the clock locker room and asked, they would, they would profess to be Christian. Right. Um, and I think that there's a smaller group that actually lived it. Um, right. and, and, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, I failed miserably at times. Um, but I think that, any given level we had, you know, you had four or five guys that you could really look at and go, okay, these are, these are the guys that I'm going to, I'm going to be with. Awesome. Um, and so that was things like that. But I mean, there's always, um, you see, you see things, you see people doing things, um, actions and things like that, that you're like, man, that's tough. You got, you got, you got to steer clear of that, you know? And so I always went back to him. I've been married for 19 years. I always, I always go back to, you know, I don't want to put myself in a situation that is going to that is going to make my wife go. Hmm, why, why would you do that? And so right. that was something that you know, it, it, because there, and I, and not that there's probably happens. plenty of those opportunities to yes, do that. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, you just like that was something, and I and I and I, I push that back to my faith because. You know, I, I don't know. It's a, that's a that's a tough question. But as far as my goal on a daily basis was to go out and and honor and glorify God, um, if that be in going and serving meals at a soup kitchen or going to the um, hospital to visit with kids that have cancer, um, put yourself out there because you're there for a purpose, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I was ultimately trying to play baseball, trying to go as far as I could in that career, and um, in, in, in that sense, but looking back on it, I look back and I see things now that it's like, man, God put you right in that in that moment to speak to that kid, and what difference did it make in that kid's life? We had a we had a kid in AAA or and in Iowa. Um, his name was Tyler, um, and and I didn't I didn't I didn't know anything about Tyler. Tyler was there all the time. Um, and come to find out he's autistic. Well, I didn't know this. This kid just sat at the end of our dugout and he talked trash to us constantly. And it was funny. And to so, your, to your team, to our team. <laughs> yes, yes. And so, um, and, and we, we always give him a hard time and Tyler still calls me to this day. Um, but we had a day where the kids got to go out on the field with us. And so Tyler wanted to come stand with me at first base. Well, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know, I knew Tyler was autistic, but I didn't know the extent of it. Tyler didn't like for people to touch him. I had no idea. And so he gets to first base, and I just reach up and I put my arm around him. And n no big deal. So we do the national anthem or whatever, and he runs off the field. I come, come off the field, you know, a little bit later. His mom's sitting there. She's just bawling. Oh, and I'm like, what's wrong? You know, and, and so we had kind of gotten to know the family a little bit. And, um, and I go over, and I was like, hey, is everything okay? And she's like, yeah. She's like, you don't understand. She's like, people don't touch him. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And she's like, you gave him a hug. She said, myself and my husband are the only people that have ever given him a hug. And so from that moment, it was like, okay, all right, God, I, I see you. I got yep, you. Right, you know, yep. So, like, those kind of things, there's always, there's always constant reminders. And looking back on it, man, it just, um, I don't know. I, I, hope, I hope that the actions that I took throughout my career have made an impact on somebody. Some of those seeds you'll, you'll never see come to yeah. fruition. But I hope that the seeds that were there – and that were planted and that were hopefully watered a little bit um, will make a difference in someone's life. That's yeah, awesome. We talk about that a lot in here as far as like what our job is, um, is not to save other people. We can't do that, but uh, to cast those seeds. That's what God calls us to do. I think like on everybody's mind, you know, about, you know, when we knew, when we knew that you were going to, when you accepted our uh, request to come and be with us, you know, we, we, we all were thinking, you know, this is how the world looks at major league athletes. You know, this is this is what we see. You know, we see all the 
the sexual harassment, sexual abuse situations. I mean, it's it's all over the news right now with uh, the Houston Texans quarterback. I mean, um, you know, we see – uh, those are we see the bad stuff, you know, and, and we think about professional athletes and we think about these these guys that are on top of the world, you know, we think they're they're confident. They, um, I mean, just from the world standpoint, you know, they have it go. They got they got it going on. the ro- The red carpet's rolled out for them, and and you know, we we were excited to hear and and uh, still are just excited to hear about how kind of how you navigated. Um, you know, being in that climate mm-hmm. from a Christian stamp, you sure. know, from a from a Christ based standpoint, and so it's really cool to just see that. You know, it's almost like you took what we try to do in our lives, like Shane's talking about, surrounding yourself with people like minded. Mm-hmm. You know, surrounding yourself with people that are going to encourage you and keep you on the right path and, and just always point you in the right direction. You use those same concepts and those same things in your life in the locker room. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. which is, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, and very cool to be honest, man, we're the, from the professional athlete standpoint, man, it is, it is, you do see a lot of it. You do see it. And I'm not saying the sexual harassment, that kind of stuff, but you do see a lot of, um, like I, we were, rookie hazing type stuff or whatever. Right. Um, you, you get up at the front of the bus and everybody on the bus is just firing really embarrassing questions at you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'll never forget, I had a guy, um, and he asked me, he says, have you ever cheated on your wife? And I just stood there and I was like, he really just asked that. And I was like, no. And he was like, really? And I was like, no. He was like, oh, okay. And I'm like, are, are you serious? That you really asked that question? And this guy's been in the big leagues for years. I'm like, and I've just I've been there two weeks. I'm like, you really just asked me that question? Of course, wow. everybody's like, you're saying. That? I'm like, that's ridiculous. And so, um, like, there were, yes, there were things like that that went on. Um, but I think, man, it's just they're no different. They face the same realities, the same same struggles that we face on a daily basis. Um, those guys face it. It's a, it's a whole different level. Right. Um, I can't imagine with the way social media and all that is these days, I cannot imagine how hard it is to actually be an athlete, to be put on that pedestal, um, because everything that you do and or say is out there. And Under a microscope. Yeah, and I can think of some of the things that I saw happen that nowadays would have been all over social media, and you'd have been like, that guy's career is over. And so um, it's just – it's interesting. It's interesting to see the difference, but really, realistically, they face the same, the same struggles, the same realities that we face every day. It's just a, it's a different, it's a different level, I guess you could say. Right. It's interesting to come at it from that point of view of compassion. Mm-hmm. You know, you you have compassion for those guys because you know what they're going through, and especially where the, the way the world's changed now with social media, it's like the the world puts them on a platform. And then they crucify them when they sin. Right, you know, right. we're all sinful. Amen. We're all sinful, and that, and the, and they're put in this position to where it's hard not to really mess up. Sure, because every opportunity in front of them is encouraging them to mess up. Right. Um, I got another gut check question for you. Ready? Yep. When you there was a moment where you said, or you had a thought. That I can't do this anymore, like I I'm done. What um, walk me through that process and and what led up to that and and how you and your family dealt with that. So when I was in was in Chicago, 2010 was my last year in Chicago, and so I I don't know that it was I can't do this anymore. It was just that you know I, I'm not I don't want to go. Triple A big league, triple A big league, triple A big leagues. I just didn't want to do that anymore. And so my, I got with my agent and I told him, I said, anything I can do to either get out of this situation I'm in in Chicago, um, which don't get me wrong, and I, I hope there's no Cub fans out there that think I'm talking about. I l- absolutely loved Chicago. Um, loved it. Would have played 20 more years there if I would have been given the opportunity. Um, but what could I do to get out of that organization at the time? Because I wasn't going anywhere in that organization. I was stuck. And so – my hope was that I could get to another organization and then I could flourish in that organization. So how the, old were you at that time? At that time I was 2010. So I was 30. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was 30. So I was getting a little older. Um, 
And then my agent came to me and says, you ever, you ever thought about playing in Japan? I said, thoughts that never crossed my mind. And he was like, all right, he said, you can make pretty good money over there. So I was like, okay. So then I started thinking, what can I do to set my family ahead to where when I quit playing baseball, I won't have to necessarily work as hard. Now, I don't get me wrong. I love to work and I'm always going to work, but I don't have to work as hard. And so that led us to that. Many prayers and thoughts went into that. But my dad always told me, and I'll never forget this. He said, when it becomes a business and it becomes work, then you got to walk away. And so in 2013, um, I was, I had come off a couple of injuries. I wasn't doing that well. Um, now, granted, I was making the most money I'd ever made in my life, but it, I was bitter. I was resentful of the game. I was resentful of the work that I was putting in. Everything, I was bitter about everything. I felt like I was letting my family down, and we had them in Japan. I was 6,000 miles away from their family. Um, and so it just got to the point where it was like it became a job. It became work. And so um, – they came you, were, to, you were 33 at that point. Yes, right? 33 at that time, yeah. Wow. And so um, they came to me and told me they were sending me, they were going to send me down to the Meyer Leagues, uh, which not that big a deal in Japan. You go down, I stayed for 10 days, and then I'd come back. Um, they would rotate the Americans on and off the roster. So no big deal. Um, but I didn't want to do it. And so I asked my interpreter, I said, this is going to sound like a really crazy question. I said, but do you think they'd send me home? You know, because at this point, I'm not doing them any good, and this is miserable for my family. And so that was kind of the, the, last little, the last little gut check for me. Um, and so he came back, and he said, Michael, they're going to send you home. And I was like, okay. And it was, it was – I mean, we were at peace with it. My wife is um, – she's been my biggest fan, my biggest supporter from the beginning of this thing. Um, <sighs> and you have to have that. In, in order to succeed in that career path, you have to have that, that support at home um, because she was – she never once openly said, I'm sick of this. Wow. You know, it was always, you know, gung-ho. Wow. I'd get sent up or I'd Incredible. get sent down. She'd pack the apartment. Um, and then she'd get in the car and drive. She had to drive home from Iowa. Um, drove home. And then five days later, we drove back to Iowa. And so she's just a trooper, man. And That's uh, awesome. Yeah. And so anyway, really, really, really cool deal. All That's right. good, man. Awesome. So – Another question popped in my head as we were talking about your travels and your journey. So not necessarily directly in the game, but it could be. Um, you got to see a lot of cool stuff. I mean, that's living in another uh, place completely out of the U.S. is awesome. What are maybe a, a couple of key moments that baseball took you on a journey that you're like, man, I'm really glad I got to experience this. And it could be in the game, outside the game. And yeah. then who might have been one of the most impactful people not family related along your journey through through baseball yeah um so one of the coolest things that i got to do got to experience it's not baseball related but it 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 happened because of baseball um we got to go to the walter reed memorial hospital man and that was you want to talk about some guys with some resilience um so we go into the amputee unit so every guy woman in this unit has either lost a limb an arm, a leg, or both, or all four. Um, and you'd go into these rooms, and all they could talk about was, I want them to fix my leg so I can go back. Man. And it was, a, that was probably one of the most, like, just impactful moments of my life because mm-hmm. I'm looking at these guys that should be just wallowing in self-pity, and they are, all they want to do is go back and protect their buddy. And, man, that was probably one of the coolest moments. We spent about two hours there. I wish I could have spent the rest of my life, you know, just visiting with those guys. Because, man, you're talking about mental toughness. You're talking about desire to be better, desire to continue to work. Man, just just a really cool experience. Um, that was probably probably one of the coolest moments that I had, you know, away from the field. I um, mean, you know, obviously, my first big league hit was pretty cool. Got to do that in front of my family in Houston. Um most impactful person like outside of um my family i probably i probably two two different people um one was a hitting coach his name was von joshua um and i had him from in double a had him in triple a and then he was an interim hitting coach in the big leagues for us for a little bit and he just he had a couple of sayings 
you know, and he, he had a real, like, hey, Hoffy, you know, it was just real. <laughs> can you hit uh, us with one of those sayings? Yeah, I, I love saying. I, I can, but one of them I got to be careful. Yeah, with. I mean. Um, yeah, but the other one, he, he always would say, you know, you, know, you come back to the guy, man, what? Josh, what, what, what you got? Hoffy, man, you got to stay on top of the ball. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay. Um, and the Italian? Other, no, he's, he's actually, he was he was an um, African-American guy, um, but I think Ron was from maybe L.A. area. But just super chill, laid back guy. Uh, and the other one was, you know, he'd always say, "Hey, you know, get on top." If I'm trying, I, mean, I can get a bleeping truck driver to try. You gotta do it. <laughs> and so, you know, it was just like those were those were pretty cool. And then the other one um, was Ryan Sandberg. Um, he was my manager in AAA. Cool. Uh, my last year here in the states, and he was he was really cool because you're talking about a Hall of Famer. No and doubt. this guy would come out every day. He'd sign autographs for an hour and a half, like during the other team's batting practice, never once complained about it. But the thing that, that resonated with me the most with Rhino was we, I was, I was mad. I was bitter. I was angry because I got sent down. I spent the entire year before in the big leagues and I got sent down in 2010 and he came to me and said, look, man, you got to make a decision. You know, are you going to continue in this self pity or are you going to freaking pick it up and go play baseball? Cause you can play. And, you know, you're, you're going to be my four-hole guy. I'm not moving you. He's like, if you can't, the ball bunt. But, my gosh, do something, mm-hmm. you know. But quit feeling sorry for yourself. Wow. And so, to this day, like, that that was probably – that's pretty cool. And um, I mean, when know. the Hall of Famer is sitting there, I mean, we all know who Ryan Samberg. Sure, I mean, sure. we watched him play. He just plays the game, played it tenaciously yeah. and just scrappy and just fun, just a competitor. When he's looking you in the eye. Are you having a little bit of like out of body experience? Well, it's just, <laughs> I would be. You feel, you feel a little bit. You feel a little bit smaller. You know, yeah. when this guy's telling you, "Look, man, what are you waiting on?" Let's yeah. go. <laughs> and so I think at that time I was hitting like one eighty five. I mean, I was miserable, um, and th- and that was kind of a turning point. And then when I got called up that year, you know, he was the guy in the office. He calls me up and he's like, "You know, it's your turn. Mm-hmm. You know, go 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 do your thing. It's your turn." And it was really neat. To have you know to feel like you had that support of that individual, and so it was it was pretty cool. But those those were probably my two two most influential in in the game of baseball. That's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. I had one more question. I think uh, somebody else might have some, but in a world that is where you are completely defined and valued by statistics, how hard is it to know that that's not where your true value lies? Oh man, that's that was easy. that was easy for me. Okay, um, I've I've never been one that chases I, I, even today in, in the business that we're in. I mean, everything we do is based on numbers. Yeah, um, and it's it's a competition that's competing. I, I'm trying to catch Sean, and I don't know that I ever will. But, you know, <laughs> we're still working towards that. Um, but no, th- so my thought process has always been pretty simple. If when you're talking about numbers, if I'm putting in the work and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do on a daily basis, my numbers will be there. And I have believed that from, gosh, the time I was little. If I am working and I am putting forth the effort that it takes to be successful, and, and we all know that effort. You're putting forth that effort to be successful. You're going to be successful. Um, and so, but as far as my value, man, my value has – now, there are times where my value was 100%. Am I hitting 300? Um, and it, it was the those times that it took – fall back to, man – where is my life centered? What, what, what am I centered on? And, you know, as I've gotten older, um, as I've become a parent, as I've become more mature in, in, in my marriage with my wife, um, it, it's gotten more and more to that Christ driven life and, and, and making sure that when I'm making a decision, that decision is based on how is this going to impact the kingdom of God? Not awesome. is, not is this impact yet? Yeah, Yes, don't get me wrong. I want to be successful. I want to make enough money for my family to be comfortable and not have a, a burden. But God wants that too. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so I believe, and and I've always believed. You know, my and my wife gave me a scripture a long time ago, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. You know, and and I love that scripture. And I love what that says, and I love the context of that scripture. And so, you know, my value, I base that. I, it's, it's not about my value. It's about what where that value goes. Um, and so I, I try to, I try to live my life to honor and glorify God. Do I do it every day? No, we stumble, man. I stumble. Um, but 
back. I love to self evaluate, and I love at the end of the day look back and go, "You sucked <laughs> <laughs> today. Today was <laughs> not your day." That's right. I'm going to so. piggyback off of that a little bit, just because a book I'm reading. Um, this this book's called Win the Day. Um, I believe the I believe the author's name is Mark Batterson. That's it. Yeah. It. Have you read it? Uh, no, but I read a bunch of his stuff. Okay. It's awesome. So this book is amazing, and and the chapter that I read last night, uh, I think the title was the mundanity of success. Um, and you just alluded to exactly what he was talking about in this book. And, and, and it's stuff that we don't think about. We, we, we look at these successful guys and they think, you know, earlier Shane, you had talked about how, uh, naturally, you know, talented Micah is and how, how naturally he's just got a smooth stroke and, 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 and and he does, but, He's in the majors for 15 years nearly, you know, at play, playing professional baseball for, for 15 years to some degree. I mean, you had to work every day. You had to work every single day, and it was – and it and you couldn't take it off. It was, it was every day, and ultimately that led to that mundanity, that every single day, you know, it's not pretty. It's it's – it's work. Mm-hmm. It's work, and you're working at it every single day. And uh, I just think that's cool that 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 you recognize that it's it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, sure. you know. And and uh, Mark Batterson talks about that in that book, and just the mundanity of success and how how success, you know, all these successful people. And he's given example after example after example. They work every day they do the same things every day and it takes time and 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 it's just it's interesting to me you know because people think oh he's overnight success oh he's just a natural he's yeah. just a natural you know and and it's like no i i hit a million balls you know uh every year you know <laughs> and and so anyway it's just it's cool uh and a testament you know to your work ethic so that's awesome man so Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, I thought I knew what it was, uh, and it was what I was thinking. So for I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and well being, and not for disaster, to give you a future and hope. And I'm gonna go ahead and read twelve because I think you alluded to it kind of in reverse order. Then you will call on me, and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear your voice, and I will listen to you. Guys, that That's that powerful. is powerful because twelve. Props up 11. Absolutely. You know, yeah, God wants us to prosper, but he wants us to have a genuine relationship with him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, prosperity might be hitting 185. Yeah. I mean, it. it we don't want to hear that as baseball players because, sure. you know, that says something in our mind about us temporarily maybe. But uh, that's pretty powerful stuff, man. I've really enjoyed hearing your story today. Me too. Sure. Sean, I've seen you taking a bunch of notes over there. You got anything to wrap up? <laughs> you know, um, I'm just grateful for your time today. Uh, I, th- I think you have a, a, a great platform and testimony. Um, I think everybody here really enjoyed you being here. And, uh, yeah, um, it's pretty cool to see, uh, you know, people that really stand out like Ryan Sandberg. You know, uh, you said Vaughn Joshua. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's crazy, and it's uh, it's really mm-hmm. just awesome to, to – to hear, uh, you know, people that have had the most profound effect on your life. I, th- I think it all kind of started with your dad, Absolutely. from what I'm hearing. And My mom uh, and dad, mom and dad are very, very big fixtures in our life for sure. Yeah, and then uh, you know, just to hear um, um, the support system you have from your wife. Um, my last question is, um, where did you and your wife meet? <laughs> So I moved from Carthage um, when I was. My dad took the job at Lawn Morris when I was going into my junior year of high school. And well, I bet Coach Lee hated that. You know, I probably so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was – I didn't want to go. Um, I was fighting for the starting position um, as a starting quarterback in Carthage. Now, Carthage was not the powerhouse back then that they are now. So, I don't I, – I was I was nowhere near what they have now. So, <laughs> um, and so, anyway, they um, – they were starting for – they were competing for that job against a guy. Uh, and then I – I mean, obviously, I was a junior. It was going to be a junior in high school, so I, I didn't want to move. Um, all my friends were there and all that stuff. But I had gone down a path at that point where I needed to get out of Carthage. I didn't know that at the time, but looking back on it, it was like, you know, 
there was a reason. It may it, it, my reason for getting getting going to Jacksonville was because I needed to get away from Carthage. So then I moved to Jacksonville. Um, still re- very very reluctant to do so. Um, until I started seeing these really pretty girls walk around the campus. Funny how that works. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's amazing. So, um, I've met my wife uh, through one of my buddies, and um, we started dating, and we broke up one time. Um, and then we had a – she was involved in a, an accident where she actually lost one of her friends. Um, and I just called her and, you know, just, hey, listen, thinking about you, praying for you, if there's anything I can do, let me know. Um, and so that kind of started it. Um, we've dated, we dated for six years before we got married. So we were high school sweethearts, man. Um, and awesome. yeah, we've been together for almost 25 years to now together, all, all together now. So, um, but man, she's a, she's an amazing woman. That's awesome. I, I've always heard, um, uh, behind every great man is a great woman. For sure. And, uh, yeah. it sounds like you definitely have one. That's awesome. For sure. All right. I got one more quick question because yeah. you mentioned at the very beginning that you read and write and that's mm-hmm. kind of your thing. And I always am fascinated by how people take information in and process it and put it sure. into action. So other than the Bible, mm-hmm. what is one of your favorite books, either all time or that you've read recently yeah. or, you know, any of that, anywhere in between? Mm, that's a tough one right there, man. I used to, I used to not read a whole lot. I used to just, I used to just get up and I'd read my Bible in the morning. Um, and, which don't get me wrong, that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, but and I try to do that every morning. Um, but here, here recently, I've started reading uh, a lot of C.S. Lewis books, and the one I'm in right now, and it's just baffling to me. And I'm doing everything I can to get through it. But it's called Mere Christianity. Um, man, it's tough. It's a tough. Read, man. <laughs> I had it to is, I had to reread every paragraph twice. Yeah, it's so tough. But I mean, <laughs> that it's dude's deep. intelligent. Yes, man. And, and but got a little Bible study group that or. Uh, accountability group, whatever you want to call it, uh, we meet and we were talking about it and they were like, man, if, if you can read this book and you can honestly walk away from it and believe that there is not a Lord and Savior in the world, you've got another thing coming. So I was like, dude, I got to read that. You know, that is awesome. And so um, reading through that one right now, um, favorite book, man. Holly, you put me on the spot there. You're trying to make me think a little bit. Um, I don't know. I used, to, I used to read a lot of novels. Um I read the whole Harry Potter series. I wouldn't say favorite by any means. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'd have to think about that, man. I really would. Cool. Um, yeah. But that mere Christianity right now, I'm um, reading another one called Redefining uh, Redefining Possible. Um, and I'm reading um, Holiness. Holiness of God, I think is what it is. Um, I just it's started It's a good one. one. Yeah. I've just, read just it started that two one. or three times because yeah. I, I feel like I have to reread that book sure. a lot. Yeah. The cool part about that that uh, I hope our listeners take away from that that I know I did is that you know, we don't always have to stay the same. You mentioned, and we have all probably said something similar to this, that you did, used to not read a lot. Yeah. You know, and then you also mentioned having an accountability group. Those are all things that are vital for men in the world today to leave, to lead lives for the kingdom of God. Absolutely. And uh, so I hope people take that away for sure. Awesome. All right. That is another episode of The Uncomfortable Truth. We want to thank Micah. Thank and you, And we appreciate you being here and kind of, just opening up to us, it's been it's been wonderful to sit here and listen to you, listen to tell your story. If you're listening out there, that was an incredible story. I'm sure you feel the same way about it as we do. But I think Micah would tell you that uh, you don't have to be a professional athlete to make a positive impact on somebody's life today. So uh, look for opportunities around you to be that positive influence, to be that positive impact for, for the people around you, for the people that God's going to place in your life today. Again, we appreciate you being here. If you would, leave us a review on whatever uh, platform you're listening on. That'll help us reach more people. Uh, the Bible verse for the day was Jeremiah 29, 11, and 12. Read that and meditate over that today. And uh, go out and kick the day in the face, and we'll catch you on the next one. <laughs>